A while back, I did a video about my smart home system. In particular, where I installed a bunch of smart lighting that's controlled by Node-RED, rather than using some sort of cloud service or pre-built pre app. And it's been working really well. But as the next stage to that, I want to upgrade my light switching, so I can have light switches that control the smart bulbs. Currently, I just have standard light switches, you know, your standard on-off light switches. And they're doing that thing that I hate about smart home stuff, where you've got a light switch in a room that's left permanently on for the smart bulbs to work. And just you never touch that switch, you never turn it off. And you see it in places where people put tape over light switches, or you can even buy little plastic caps to cover your light switch with. And that sort of stuff just annoys me. I'd much rather have a switch on the wall that just behaves like a light switch and controls the smart bulbs. You can kind of get around it by putting, say, a smart remote next to it, but I don't really want that either. What I want is a light switch that just looks like a normal light switch. I can have guests over, I don't need to explain how the lights work, they can walk into a room, flick the switch on the thing on the wall that looks like a light switch, and the lights will come on, and then they want to turn the lights off again. They flick the same switch on the wall, and the lights go off. So we'll be taking a look at that in this video. And what we're using for that is this, which is the Sonoff Mini. And this is the second version of it, I think it's the Sonoff Mini R2. And this is a really neat little device. I wanted to take a look at this for a while, but I've never quite got around to it. But if you've heard of Sonoff, what they do is they make little Wi-Fi smart switches. I've used them before for my central heating and stuff like that. Basically, cheap little Wi-Fi smart switches. However, what's good with them is even though out of the box they come with some sort of firmware, I think it's called i10, you can use this EWI Link app and you can it connects to their cloud and you use an app. It's one of those standard things. The great thing with Sonoff hardware is it uses standard ESP8266 or similar microcontrollers, so you can flash different firmware onto them. So that's what we'll do with this. We'll take this, we'll flash on the Tasmota firmware, which is open source firmware, which will turn this into a device that will talk over MQTT, which will talk to Node-RED. So let's take a look what we get. So this device itself is essentially a standard little Sonoff, it's a tiny little thing, and it works like a Sonoff. It's got a relay in it, so you can have your mains input here, it's also got a switched mains output, and you can connect that to your whatever you want, and it'll switch the load. Now in my situation, I'm not going to be using this to switch anything, because the bulbs are smart bulbs, so they'll be permanently powered. You could, if you wanted to, say, convert a regular traditional bulb to a smart light, you could use the output to switch the light on and off. But in my situation, I'm not going to use that. I'm just going to power this off the mains and not connect anything to the switched output. However, you'll notice with this that there's these additional switch inputs here, labelled S1 and S2. This is a switch input. So what you can do is you can connect a, wire or a cable from this into a light switch, and when you toggle that switch, it will send a signal to the on off. So that's what I want to have here. It's a traditional looking light switch on the wall that when you toggle it, the on off sends a message over MQTT to Node Red, and that'll trigger my smart bulbs. So for that, we're going to need a light switch. And there's a few different options you could do with this. First of all, you could just use an existing light switch, just your traditional off the shelf light switch that you've already got. Something like this, it would just be a standard rocker switch that clicks into either position and works like a normal light switch. And that would work fine. But I'm the sort of person that gets really OCD about switch positions, and it would really annoy me having a switch that looks like it's on when the lights are off. To me, it's actually at a level where I've got like two-way switching in my hallway, and I cannot stand having it set so the lights are off, but both switches are in the on position. I always have to make sure I turn the right ones off so the lights look off it. Yeah, it drives me mad. So I don't want to use something like that. However, there's a different type of switch you can get called a retractive switch. And it's something like this. These are quite common. You, you see them a lot more in commercial settings, whether again, systems like this, centralised dimmer, stuff like that, or on things like exit buttons for doors. But it looks like a standard switch, but when you click it, you'll see it springs back up. And that's what I'll be using. There's another type of retractive switch you can get as well, which is this one here, which can click into two different positions. So that can click that way or that way. I won't be using this, but you could use this. What you need to do is you need to take, take this on off apart and solder it onto one of the other GPIOs, so we'll take a look at how we would do that. And that way you could have two different buttons, maybe a dim up or a dim down button or something like that. So that's a few different options. Now when you're buying switches like this, one thing I would definitely say is don't just look online at a retractor switch and just buy the first one you see. Put a bit of effort in and try and work out what existing electrical accessories you have. Especially if you're in a fairly modern place or a place that's sort of been rewired as a whole, chances are all your light switches and sockets will match, they'll be from the same product line. So it's worth actually taking something off the wall and looking, see if you can find a brand name or a model number or even just Google image search it and see if you can find what existing electrical accessories you've got. 
Because if it's from a reputable line and not a sort of cheap off brand thing, chances are you'll be able to get retractive switches from the exact same product line. And that means you can have them aesthetically match all your other accessories. Because even though if you get stuff that's like a standard white, look, like a white light switch, if you buy one from a different brand, it might be a slightly different shade or a different curved profile or a different shaped rocker. So actually putting a bit of effort into work out exactly what you've got and buy the appropriate part that matches is quite a good idea. Now for retractive switches, you can't usually get them as like a standard switch plate. You sometimes can, but it's a bit rarer, you know, where it comes as assembled as a full piece. Usually they come like this, which are grid modules. So what you need to do is you need to get, you buy the module itself and you might need to buy some grid plates that, fit, that this fits into. This is the same sort of system you get in say a kitchen where you've got a bunch of different switches for your appliances. So you get your modules here and then you usually have to get a couple of other parts. This varies between product lines. With my stuff here, all my accessories are from the MK Dimensions line. And for the grid system with that, you buy these two separate parts here. You get this, which is the grid mounting frame, and then you separately buy the decorative faceplate and whatever finish you wanted, and then that clips over it. That's how this one works. Um, other lines, you, you buy like a, let's say a, a screwed faceplate that screws over it, and you get a metal thing behind it called a yoke that screws in that the modules clip into. Some from, for example, Click, um, you essentially get a single piece like this. You screw the modules into the back of it, and it just makes a sort of single piece type switch. But with the particular line I've got here from, which is MK Dimensions, you buy the frame, the mounting plate, and the modules separately. And all you do is you assemble your grid by just clicking your modules in there like that. And they just click in, and then once you've screwed that to the wall, the front plate just clicks over it and gives you the final result, which looks pretty neat. Now the other thing you've probably noticed is that I've got space for two modules on this faceplate, and that's not an accident, it's an intentional decision. Now, it's worth mentioning that you can get grid plates in multi-gang variants. You can get them 2-module, 3-module, 4-module, 6-module, 1-module, whatever you want. So you could do that if you wanted to, say, have one smart switch with a Sonoff, but then separately have another traditional switch to control a different light. However, in my situation, I'm only actually going to be using a single switch in it, so I'll be using this retractive switch here. And in the other module, I'm going to have a switch to control my lights. And by that I mean I want to have a smart switch that controls the bulbs smartly, but I want to have a traditional switch that lets me just isolate power to the lights and the sawn off. That means if I'm going away for a while, I can just turn the power off so they're not sitting there bleeding power. I can safely change light bulbs without having a live lamp holder in my hand. If the system ever plays up, I can turn the power off to try and restart it. Or for example, if I have a smart bulb fail and I don't have any spares, I can just stick some dumb, some dumb conventional bulbs in and control them with a the switch. However, if I put a normal light switch like that in, that would just be a nightmare because I'd constantly turn the wrong one off and it would just be a total pain. So what's really good with grid systems is you can get key switches. And this is something I would really recommend that even if you're not doing any of the smart switching, if you're happy with your voice assistant or your smart remote or whatever, and you've just got a light switch on the wall that you just leave permanently on and tape over so people don't turn it off, I strongly recommend just going and getting a key switch that costs very little and replacing your light switch with it. Because what you can do with these, they're very common in commercial settings, but they come with a little key like that. It's a standardised key, it's not an actual, like, special key that's like, that matched that's matched to the switch, they're just universal, across at least across the brand. But it's a little switch, you can put the key in and use the key to turn it off, on and off. So it means that in a situation that, that you need to use the switch, you easily can, I mean, especially you know, with these ones, you can even kind of leave the key hanging out them pretty easily. But, if you leave that in the wall switched on, people can't come along accidentally and turn your light switch off. So, what I'll essentially be doing is replacing my existing light switch with a key switch, which will switch the power to the lights. And I'll then be putting the sawn off behind it, connected to the retractive switch, and that'll be acting as a smart switch, which will actually turn the lights on and off. So yeah, here we have all the hardware we'll be using. The sawn off mini, a standard retractive switch, a key switch, and then the appropriate grid module and grid plate and all that sort of stuff to put it on the wall. Now something else I'm going to quickly add in while I'm talking about retractive switches, is just if you're buying them, making sure you buy the right thing because the terminology can get quite confusing. And it definitely threw me a couple of times. This retract this is a standard retractive switch that just clicks like that in one so it's an it's normally one position you click it to the other position. And this comes in two variants. It can either be a one-way retractive switch or a two-way retractive switch. This particular one is a two-way retractive switch. What that means is that even though it you know, clicks like that. On the back, it has a common contact 
and then two switch contacts as I'm making a break, which is essentially normally open and normally closed. Different manufacturers do it differently. MK do that, they label it make and break. Others just label it L1 and L2. I think I bought a Skullmore one previously that literally had the markings of a double pole switch that were totally unrelated to the actual switching internals, which wasn't ideal. Um, but yeah, you'll have essentially a common and two switched, one which will be normally open, one which will be normally closed. And if you do get one of these and the switching is confusing, or the labeling is confusing, you might want to use a multimeter to check what it's, which is normally open, which is normally closed. But that would be referred to as a two-way retractive switch. Alternatively, this would be like a one-way retractive switch, obviously it's a different style. But essentially the only difference with a one -way, between a one-way retractive and a two-way retractive is this clicks in the exact same way. But it has essentially one or two terminals, it's got you know, a common and then a output, but it's just got one switch. So when you click it, these make contact, and when you let go, these don't make contact. So it's essentially it's only got a normally open contact. That would be one way. This would be two way. So then this type here that you get is like this is not a two way retractive switch. It's usually referred to as a two way retractive switch with center off. Because if you look on the back, the contacts are the same. You've got a common one and two. They're labeled differently, but it's one and two. But when you've got it in the middle position, there's no connection between any of these. When you click it in the top position, common connects to one of these, and you click it to the bottom position, common connects to the other one. So this is not necessarily a two-way retractive switch. It's a two-way retractive switch with center off, and this is a two-way retractive switch. So just don't get confused when you're buying them, because often, especially on sort of electrical wholesalers, wholesalers where you have to buy these things from, they tend not to have very good pictures. Sometimes just there aren't any pictures, or it's just a picture of the front of it that that's overexposed so you can't actually see what the front looks like. So you do need to be quite careful and make sure you do buy the right one. But yeah, just a bit of an aside there if you're trying to buy these because it can get a little bit confusing. So yeah, that's all the hardware we're going to use. So we'll get rid of all the switches and stuff for now. We won't need that for a little while. So let's take a look at the sawn off itself. So I've already shown what it's like. Essentially, tiny little box, really neat. Will easily fit, fit in a sort of switch patterns box. You you maybe not in like a 16 mil patterns, you will need a sort of reasonably deep one. And you will require a neutral at your switch. But other than that, it is a pretty neat little device. You see the terminals in the bottom, you've got neutral in, neutral in, they're both just common together, hence they're both labelled in. Doesn't matter which you use for in and out. Live in, live out, then switch one, switch two. Now it is also worth bearing in mind that you will need a neutral at your switch. This really comes down to how your place is wired. If it was wired relatively recently, chances are you'll have a neutral at your switch. A lot of older places won't. So it is just worth bearing that in mind that this will require a neutral at the switch. And it's also worth saying that if you're doing this sort of stuff and you're not confident with electrical stuff, don't attempt this yourself, get a professional in. I have a decent enough working knowledge, I know what I'm doing so I can do it. But in this video I'll show kind of how I'm doing it roughly, but I'm not going to do an in-depth tutorial of how to connect up what wires go where because I don't want someone copying this video blindly, going, oh well he put the blue wire in here and the brown wire in here so I'll do the same. And then they find their systems wired differently and they blow something up. So do not attempt this unless you actually understand A, electrics, B, regulations in your country, and see how your particular place is wired because there's a lot of variations in it. But yeah, that's on off and the connections on it. You then just got a little button here which can act, act as a push button out, out the box that'll toggle the output on and off. With Tasmosa you can make it do different things, but yeah, it's a little push button there, and that's really it. So what we'll do is we'll quickly pop it open and take a look inside. So it's not actually screwed together at all, it's literally just clipped together. Not ideal, but it's fine because this will ultimately be inside a sort of secure electrical enclosure anyway. And that's one thing that's worth mentioning with the Sonoff Minis in particular, is that you kind of need to have this inside a sort of another enclosure because there's no way to terminate wires into this without the basic insulation exposed because you can't, there's no cord grip that you can hide the outer insulation in. Plus these screws are quite, they're recessed, but if you press your finger hard enough you could probably make contact with the screw underneath. So unlike the larger Sonoffs that you can kind of have out on show, this would kind of need to be inside in a sort of separate enclosure, but that's fine, I'll be doing that. But yeah, with it popped open, inside we can see we have a little board here. Now, I'm not an electronics expert, so I can't go into a huge amount of detail, but you've got the relay there, it's a 16 amp relay, which is pretty high, I don't know if I'd switch 16 amps with this, but apparently it can, um, unless they're sort of over-provisioning over the relay. Um, yeah, actually it does say 10 amps max on the Sonoff itself, so they're rating this up to 10 amps. So it's nice they're actually over-specking the relay, but yeah, you wouldn't want to switch more than 10 amps with this, but 
that's fine. <laughs> We've got LED light bulbs. A little bit of power supply circuitry over here, relay there. That's a button, a couple of LEDs. Then on the bottom, you can see we have, well, the main circuit. So the main thing up here is the main chip, which as you can see, is a standard ESP8285. Yep, ESP8285. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think that's based on ESP8266 with a built-in flash memory, something like that. But anyway, it's a standard ESP microcontroller that's compatible with Tasmota. Additionally, up here, you'll see you have a few little solder pins you can go onto. This is a serial header. So you've got ground, three volts, transmit and receive. And they're absolutely tiny. But if you wanted to flash this firmware, the conventional method using a serial adapter, you need to solder wires onto those four headers there and connect up your sort of USB serial adapter. But in this video, we're going to do something different, so I'll show that. Additionally, down here, you can see there's a couple of other sort of solder pads, one labelled key in, one labelled log. These are additional GPIOs. I think the bottom one's GPIO0, which I think is linked to this switch here, but these can be used for additional inputs. I'm not going to do that here, but it does mean that you could potentially solder wires onto these and break them out of the enclosure and use that to connect additional switches. So for example, you could use a you know, two-position switch, two-way centre off switch or something like that. One thing I saw, is a I think it was a random blog post online that actually looked quite quite a nice idea, was what they did is they took off this grey screw terminal here and replaced it with a three-pole three one like this, a, a smaller one, but a similar idea. And what they did basically is they drilled an extra hole into the PCB here, replaced that header with one like this, and then soldered wires across it so they could have two switch inputs, but still terminated through screw terminals, which I thought was really neat. They just needed to drill a hole and cut away a bit of the casing, so that's definitely a nice way you could do it. I'm not going to modify it, but you definitely could use that if you wanted to connect additional devices to the GPIOs on this. But yeah, that's Sonoff. Seems like a really neat device, definitely very happy with the sort of build quality. Sonoff devices are always pretty good, I've never really seen any major issues with them at all. So yeah, that's the board there. So now we need to flash this with Tasmota because out of the box you turn this on and it boots onto one of those standard cloud-based smart things that I have honestly never used with Sonoff hardware. It'd be interesting to know how many people actually ever use the Sonoff Cloud stuff in their app versus how many people flash it because every time I see a Sonoff it's been flashed. But as you've probably seen previously on this channel and loads of other videos, traditionally when you flash a Sonoff what you do is you solder wires onto the serial header, use a USB to serial adapter and then use software to flash the firmware. But with the Mini and with some of the newer Sonoffs they've actually got a really nice new feature I want to try out. Which if you look at the box you can see they advertise it there which is DIY mode. And this is something I really like. It's a really nice thing seeing sort of companies making smart products actually catering for the DIY market. Now, as standard with DIY mode, what this lets you do is you turn it on, I think you hold the button down a certain combination or something like that. We'll try it in a second. It starts the device up into alternative firmware. And what that means is that rather than connecting to their cloud and doing all that sort of stuff, it'll connect to your network and the system will host a REST API. So you can issue standard REST API calls to this just HTTP requests, and use that to read switch input or to toggle relay, stuff like that. And that's really nice. It means you can buy a Sonoff and actually just control it with a REST API out of the box. However, for me, I also want to flash this with Tasmota so I can do a bit more custom stuff around the, the GPIO input so I can read the switch and not have it control the relay. And also so it can talk over MQTT to no dread because that's much, e much easier for me to work with than having to use a REST API. But what's good with DIY mode is it also has a system where you can, in DIY mode, issue an HTTP command to update the firmware. And all you do is you basically issue an HTTP command, provide a URL to the firmware image, and then Sonoff will download it and install the firmware. And that includes third-party firmware like Tasmota. So in theory with this, we can connect it up and flash Tasmota onto this without having to open it up or solder anything at all, which will be really cool to try out. So we'll give that a go. So what we now need to do is get it connected up to power, bring in a laptop, and try and flash the firmware. Okay, so now connect the Sonoff up to power, just connect it to plug for now. Obviously it'll be wired into the back of the light switch once I actually connect it up. And again, do not try this if you don't know what you're doing when it comes to electrics. But what'll happen now if you plug this in, not very much, but <laughs> what you'll see is just behind there, you'll see a little white uh, or blue light flashing away. And this is it starting up into the normal firmware, the sort of, EWI Link Sonoff official firmware that doesn't 
support maps, it goes to a cloud service, you need to use their special app and all that sort of stuff. So what we'll now need to do is put it into DIY mode and flash the firmware. Okay, so now before we go any further, there's one big safety thing I want to point out about this. Now I'm not an electronics expert, I'm not Big Clive, but it's just a very, very important thing to point out. With the Sonoff Mini, I don't know about other Sonoff, but I think in particular the Mini, the mains power supply isn't fully isolated from the, from this things like the switch input, it's a low voltage side. It's not got like a transformer in it, it's more like a, it's a very basic power supply circuit. So what this basically means is that the switch inputs are, they're sort of at mains potential. It's not like it's a mains current level, you know, it's not like it's a direct connection between like live and this, it's not like it's main, I don't know if it would have full current, but they are, they do, they sort of are at mains potential. So if we take a look at a multimeter here and we check between the switch contact or one of them, neutral, you'll see that's 132 volts or whatever. Likewise, if we look at the other one there, which one of these is a GPIO pin, one's ground. As you can see that, again, 130 volts. Now, that's not the full mains voltage. If you look between live and neutral, you'll see that's 240 volts. But these are kind of at like half mains potential. So, yeah, I don't think that would be full current. So I'm, not, I'm not sure. But basically what that means is anything that you're connecting into these switch inputs, you basically need to treat as though they're live at mains voltage. Now that's perfectly fine for what I'm doing here because I'm installing it inside a electrical pattern anyway. The switches I'm using are, you know, rated for full mains voltage and everything, so we're totally fine. But what you want to be very careful of, if you're like bridging these out to test, don't use something, don't use anything uninsulated. Ideally, just connect a switch to it. Don't leave wires hanging out and touch them. Don't connect it to something that you that can't handle high voltage. Treat these as though they're sort of at mains potential just because, well, they are. So just be very careful there. Even though they go between a GPIO pin and ground at the DC side, they are still high voltage. So you want to kind of be careful there. Now that's not necessarily as bad as the original Sonoff Mini where the antenna that came out the side was also live at mains voltage. And I remember seeing a thing where someone, I think they had the antenna coming out and the insulation scraped off and it hit against an earth back box and blew the thing up. So it's maybe not as bad as that, but you do want to be quite careful with these Input. So I just wanted to put out a big safety warning that if you've got one of these, don't treat it as like a little 5 volt Arduino with a nice little low voltage GPIO output. These are, these are at, well, half of main poten mains potential. So yeah, treat these as being live at mains voltage. Use proper mains insulated cable, use mains voltage rated switches, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, just a safety warning there. But now that's out of the way, let's get on to the flashing. Okay, so I'm now going to give it a little while to start up. And what we now need to do is put this into DIY mode. So following the instructions on the Tasmoto website, we need to long press this button for five seconds, which will put it into what they're calling pairing mode. And then after that, you need to press it again for another five seconds to put it into compatible pairing mode, where, which I think is where this then becomes an access point. So it holds down for five seconds. Yep, the light's now flashing differently. Now that light's actually flashing constantly um, or continuously, which is what it says. And I only need to press it once for that. So it said, press for five seconds to enter pairing mode and then press for another five seconds to enter compatible pairing mode. And the indicator should blink constantly, but that indicator there is already blinking constantly after five seconds. So in theory, if I now check my Wi-Fi settings, my phone, yep, it's showing up. So the sun off is now showing up on my phone. That's what I need to do is put the password in, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, in there. And if I connect to that access point, that should connect me to the sun off. So we'll do that. See what happens. Cool. So connect to the internet. That's fine. So keep the Wi-Fi connection. And now what should happen if I open up a web browser? and go to the IP address, which is 10.10.7.1. There we go, 10.10.7.1, and there we go. We've got Sonoff DIY mode up. So what I need to do is go into Wi-Fi setting there, fill in my network details, and connect it to the Wi-Fi. So I just need to connect it to my network, and then we'll come back. Okay, so I did that, just basically put my SID and password in. Now you can see there, I'm now connected. So that says I'm connected to it, it's just showing up on the ESP device. I've got an IP address there. 
So that's working. So what I can now do is use that IP address with the REST API to talk to this and update the firmware. So to do that, I'll need to jump over to the laptop. So I'll do a sort of screen recording for a little bit. And then we'll come back onto the actual camera once that's done, but I'll go and show the flashing process. Okay, so it's now time to flash the firmware. So I'm following the instructions on the Tasmota website. It's just the, if I search for like Tasmota Sonoff DIY, they've got this page that shows how to do it. So this is the sort of instructions I'm following. So it's already all flashed. And this gives you some sort of curl commands to let you issue the API commands to Sonoff. But instead, I'm going to use the software called Postman, which is quite good. It's just a nice, web, nice sort of interface for sending post requests and lets you kind of visualize it all, makes it a bit easier. And for this, someone's already made a sort of template for the Sonoff API. So I've just Googled it was Sonoff Postman, and it's just the second one here for Protocol 2.0. I'm just going to copy this JSON here, go into Postman, hit Import, raw text, paste that in, and press Continue. Import that there. And over here, it gives you this, the appropriate commands for enabling DIY mode, getting device info, and uploading the firmware. So yeah, pretty simple there. So in Postman here, you can see you have all different requests here that you can make out. So enable DIY mode, which is actually the wrong term. It's, that's to enable OTA unlock, so you can send over their updates, which is what we're going to do. Get the device info, upload the firmware, and change the switch state. But you'll see each of these has the base URL sort of as a variable, so we need to define that. So to do that, we've got the project here, go to the variables tab and put base URL. And then here we need to put the IP address and port. So in my case, the IP address is 10.114.2.119. Obviously that'll depend on your network. And we also need to put the port number in, which is 8081. And we need to make sure we hit save up here. And that's now in. So now that's in there. If we go to the get device info first, we'll run that request. And down here we can see it's worked. So that says switch dates off, startup off, which is basically all the information. So that is it working. So that's the device info. We're able to communicate with it. So now that's done, the next thing we need to do is enable DIY mode or OTA unlock. I don't like the term there, but yep. So it says enable DIY mode, but it's actually this OTA unlock command that gives it. So send that there. Wait for that to finish. It came back with no errors, that's good. And once again, if we go to get device info, whereas previously, it said that um, OTA unlock was false. We're on that now. And this time OTA unlock is true. So that's worked. So that's actually correctly enabled, DI enabled OTA updates. So what we now need to do is go over here and upload the firmware. So what you'll see if we go to the request body, you can see there's some information here where we need to actually supply a hash and a, and a URL to download the file from. Now, previously I've tried this by actually downloading the firmware from the Tasmota site and hosting a web server on my laptop just using the Python built-in HTTP server. And I was having issues. I could get this on off to start downloading, but then it would download the file really, really slowly. And after a while, it would the Python server would like time out and close the connection. So if you wanted to, you could actually just host your own web server and do it that way. But to be honest, there's already someone else that's done it for you. So here we have the Tasmota website. And as you can see down here, it says, as you can see, there's not been reported issues using the stock firmwares with an existing web server. So there's already an existing server that someone set up a mirror and this just mirrors all the official Sonoff firmware and also provides the SHA hashes which you need because you need these hashes if you want to um, you, know, you, need to be, you need to put a hash into the request as well. So for that we're going to use the latest one from here which is 10.0 Sonoff Tasmota latest isn't actually the latest because latest 10 don't know so we're going to use the URL to version 10 10.1 is currently out but what I'll do is I'll install 10 from this and then I'll later do an update from within the Tasmota interface. It's just easier than trying to create my own web server. So copy the link address to that, put that into there. And then likewise, we're going to take the hash from here as well and put that in here. Now, if you were diehard and you did definitely want to host it yourself, basically stick the file on the web server that you can put the URL in here and do a SHA256 hash and stick the hash in there. Dead easy. So now both of those are in there. I'm going to hit the send button and that should start the off flashing. So that said error zero, which I think is good. And we're now just going to need to wait for it. The other thing I should have demonstrated that I didn't is that down here, there's also the switch state option. So this is the request you could give to actually switch to toggle the switch. So toggle switch between on and off. So if you were wanting to just to use this 
with DIY mode as a REST device, with a REST API, you could do it that way as well. But yep, in theory, the firmware is out flashing. Helpful, there's no feedback, and that's the one benefit of running your own web server, is you can actually see the network traffic going out from the server. But I'll give it a few minutes, and then wait for it to come back. Hopefully. I mean, worst case, if you did brick it like this, you just need to do a serial flash. So you're not going to totally brick your device and make it useless. But I thought it'd be quite fun to try this out. The only other thing worth mentioning is if you are using the Sonoff DIY mode, you can only use firmware up to a maximum of 508 kilobytes. So that means you have to use Tasmota Lite, not the full version of Tasmota. Now, for what we're doing here, there's no real difference. Um, Tasmota Lite just doesn't contain some drivers for some external hardware. So if you wanted to use some specialist hardware with, with a GPIO input, you might not have the drivers in Tasmota Lite, but you can probably get away with it. All we're doing here is using switch input, so it's fine. And if you did need something that was in the full version of Tasmota, you could still do it. You just have to flash it over serial instead. But I wanted to try the OTA DIY mode because it's actually neat being able to buy a smart device off the shelf and flash custom firmware onto it without even actually opening the case. So yeah, just wait for this. I'll then keep, I'll just keep an eye out on the network waiting for it to come back. And I'll come back once it's up and running. Okay, and we're back. So that was a little bit fiddly. I've sort of set it up, let it do the firmware update, and then I waited and just checked, checked for it on my network. And eventually I noticed it dropped off my network, so I thought, well, that must be updated, so I restarted it. But it just never came back on my network, nor was it broadcasting an SSID at all. So it's kind of just like dead to the world. So I wasn't quite sure what happened, so I performed this fast power cycle device recovery, they describe. I tried holding the button down for 40 seconds, but that didn't work. So I did this step here, that just basically turn it on and off at the mains six times and leave it on after the seventh. And after doing that, it broadcast the Wi-Fi network, which you can see here, and I was able to connect to it. And after doing that, macOS pulled up this captive portal screen that lets me connect to Wi-Fi. If you're on a machine that doesn't do that, you just need to go to the IP address 192.168.4.1. And from here, we can connect to Wi-Fi. So a bit weird there as to why it did that. I've done this before and it didn't do that, so don't know why it did it this time. But that was fine. Just do a, that power off reset and that fixed it. Had that not worked, I'd have just ended up doing like a serial flash. But yeah, I got it working in the end. So what I need to do now is connect to my Wi-Fi here. I'll come back once it's on my actual network. Okay, and we're back. So as you can see, we've now got the Tasmota web interface up here. And if I click the toggle button here, the sun will turn on and off. You probably can't, well, obviously there's no camera, but you can maybe hear it click on and off. So it's working. Now all I've done here really is set up the Wi-Fi and then I've also gone into configuration, configure MQTT and set my MQTT host here and given it a name for the topic. That lets it then work on MQTT. So if we go back out of that, I can bring in MQTT Explorer, which connects to my MQTT broker. We can see in there we have a few different topics. There's Tele, which shows like telemetry from it, it's online state. Stat, which is like the switch state, so currently it says power is off. If I then adjust the windows, you can sort of see both. And then I can toggle it. Power will then go on and off, so you see that's updating on MQTT. Now, one thing you'll notice is if I then go onto the switch contacts and bridge them together, you obviously can't see it because I've not got the camera on right now, but if I bridge across these, you'll notice nothing happens. Also being extremely careful not to go onto the mains contact beside that one, but anyway, nothing happens. And that's because the switches aren't configured. So if I go into configuration, configure module, you've got all the GPIOs here and you can set the config for them. So if we set GPIO4 down to switch there, and I just leave the set to one and hit save. That's now configured the GPIO4, which is the switch or the switch input, and told it that it's a switch. So once the sawn off re restarts and it comes back up again, hopefully that's it there. Yep. And then we go on to these switch contacts. You'll see that when I'm holding the switch down, the relay turns on. And if I let go, the relay turns off. It's best to look over at MQTT here, it takes it updates quicker in the web interface. But if you look at MQTT on the right, if I again go into switch contacts, turns on, let go, it turns off. So that works. However, this isn't what I want here for a couple of reasons. First of all, that's almost like a latching switch. So if you had a latching switch going into that, that would work. But I want a momentary switch, not a latching switch. But secondary, secondly to that, I don't want that to trigger the relay. With my setup here, as I mentioned, I'm just using this literally as a remote. I'm just using this as a switch to MQTT converter. I'm not actually using the relay. So I don't really want to be switching the relay on and off. In particular, there's definitely scenarios where I might be using these, where I want to use it as like a switch input, 
but I separately want to control the relay, but I don't want that relay to necessarily relate to the switch. So what we need to do is set a couple of configuration options in Tasmota to set it so that instead of the switch input controlling the relay, it does everything purely over MQTT. So the switch input just sends messages over MQTT and we can control the relay using MQTT. Now currently we can't actually control the, MQTT, the relay using MQTT. As you can see here, I've got the message already here where I've got CMND, the name of the on off, and then power one, which is the, the relay. Currently off, so if I set this to on and send that message, the relay clicks, it turns on, and it turns on over there. And likewise, we just put off in here, and then click it, it turns off. So it is working. But as I mentioned, what I want to do is decouple it so that the switch input sends messages over MQTT and doesn't necessarily control the relay. So we'll do that, and it's actually quite simple. Now, the first thing we need to do is configure the inputs. So as we, how, well, previously we had it set that module type was off basic and GPIO4 was set to a switch input. But we need to change this. So first of all, we need to change the module type to generic module and hit save. Wave to restart and then go back in. And then we can, we can set the GPIOs up. I found that if you did it with it set to that off basic, it just didn't work. So I'm not a Tasmo expert, so I don't necessarily know why, but now that's done, we can go back in, configure module, and then now we've got a lot more GPIOs, which you'd also need if you wanted more GPIOs to play with. But in here, we can take GPIO4 and set it to button. There's two different types here you could use. You could use button or switch. The way they're designed, button's designed for a push button, switch designed for a switch. When you use it set to button, it'll send MQTT events each time the button's clicked, and it'll count the number of clicks. So if you set it, click it, say, three times in quick succession, it'll send a triple click event. If you send it, click it once, it sends a single click event, and so on. However, that won't send events for the button being pressed and the button being released. It's just purely for how many times it's clicked. On the other hand, the switch type will send an event for when the switch is switched on and the event for when it's switched off. This is more designed for like rocker switches that latch in different positions. But if you're using a retractive switch and you want to be able to separately detect it being pressed and then released, for example, you want to have a, an event for if it's held down to dim the lights or something, then you'd want to use a switch type event, a switch type here and then basically build your logic off of the on-off events to work out whether the switch is being held down or released. But for this, we'll set it to button and hit save again. Wait for it to restart, and then we can set up the options. So once that comes back up, give it a little second, there we go. We can go to the console. And if we go over here, we can see we have so a bunch of options. So these are all available on the Tasmota website. And these are all different configuration items you can set. In particular, the one we need to set is option 73, which says detach buttons from relays and send multi-press and hold MQTT messages instead. So that's what we need to do. So all we need to do in the console is run set option 73, 1. Oh, nope, don't hit main, I've done, I keep doing that. Hit main menu, nope, you need to hit enter. Set, op, try again. There we go. So that's set that option. There's one additional option we also need to set, which is all the way down here, and it's option one. That's because this will issue multi-click events. So you can click it multiple times, and you know, clicking it once sends a single click, clicking it twice sends a double click. However, if you click it, I think, six times, I think, or I think you hold it down, both of those events will sort of factory reset the sun off. And I don't want a way to have a switch on the wall that someone could just be fiddling with and manage to reset the sun off. So if we set option one to one, that will restrict the number of clicks so you can't reset it from the button. So set option one to one. Now that can't accidentally be restarted or reset. And now if we come over to MQTT here, and then we click switch, there you go. It sent a message for button one, action is single. If I double click it, is double, triple click it, so on. You know, go five times, penta. <laughs> yeah, it'll do quad and penta. So you can do that and it'll, so you can try, you know, record multiple amounts of clicks. So that works. However, you'll notice that there's no relay set up in here. We need to configure that. So we can come in here, configure that, go to configure module, and we know that the relay is on GPIO 12. That's in the documentation. So we can go GPIO 12 and that is a relay and hit save. 
and again wait for that to restart. Then once that comes back up, we'll then be able to use the relay as well. So wait for that to come up here. Back out to main menu. Now the relay, sh relay shows up, and if I click that, the relay clicks on and off. And now if we come over into MQTT, we can send an on command to that topic there. Turns on, off command, turns off. But if I click the button, it sends the click events, but it does nothing with the relay. So that's what we wanted. Obviously, if I want the button to control the relay, I can do that through Node Red, but they're no longer directly coupled at the hardware level or the firmware level. Okay, so just for completeness, I'll show how to set the switch input to act like a switch rather than a button, so you can react differently to the button being pressed and then released if you, in case you want to have like long press events, which is totally possible, but it's a little bit weird. So if we go into configuration, configure module, we can change that button to a switch. However, as soon as you do that, that will now start controlling the relay. Exactly the same as it was before, even with that option 73 set, don't quite know why. You then have this number here, so you can use this to like pair up different numbers of inputs and outputs. So you can set that to two, which is different than the number of the relay. But for some bizarre reason that still doesn't work, that will still make the switch control the relay. What you kind of need to do, I don't know why, but what seems to work is you need to pick another GPIO output or to, to act as an output, put another relay on it and then match the number. So make put, basically put relay two in here somewhere and that will then stop the switch controlling this relay. I don't know why it's set up like that. I feel it's them trying to make it smart and easier by not having to have, if you've only got one relay and one switch that they just automatically control each other, but it's a little bit annoying. So we just need to pick any other GPIO that isn't used. In this case, I'll use GPIO 13, which is matched to the LED on the board. So we'll actually see an LED blink. But hit relay, change that to two. So we switch to controls relay two and save that. And that will now let us use this, use the input as a switch rather than a push button. So as that comes back up, you'll see in here, we have two topics, power one and power two. And now there's two relays showing up in here. If I toggle one, that's the actual relay itself. You might hear that clicking on and off. If I toggle two, that's just the blue LED on the mother on the main board. But now when I click the button, what you'll see is power two here will respond. So I'm holding the button down now, that says on. And if I let go of the button, that says off. So this is kind of how you would do it. If you needed to be able to detect the click and release, you need to do that weird mapping in there. And then you can look at these on off events of power two to work at what state your push button's in. Not ideal, but it does work. But for my setting here, because I literally just want to use click the button to turn the lights on and off, I'll just set that to button, GPL 13 to none, save that, and I'll just respond to button click events. That's absolutely fine. So now that's there. Control the relay state there, and I can click my button however many times I want, and that will send the appropriate MQTT actions. So that's worked. So now that's everything set up on the soft on the sort of firmware and Tasmota side. Let's jump back over to the camera and take a look at what we'll be doing. Okay, so there we are. That's all new flashes Tasmota. Now, excuse this absolute abomination. I just had a scrap of what cable, so that's not how it's going to be put in properly. That's just a bit of scrap to a nerf hat lying around. But yeah, that's all set up. So this was a test ray I was using, so it's all got Tasmota now. And if I click that button once, looking over at the laptop, that sent a single click event. If I double click it, that sent a double click event. So that's working fine. So what we now need to do is go and get this installed. So I just need to take the light switch off, wire the key switch in its place, and then off of the switch side of that, wire power to the son off, and then wire the switch inputs on the son off into the retractive switch like that. So time to go and do that. Okay, so before I go through and actually install this, I've just made one of them up. I've done the actual connections because it'll be easier to do it on the table than to get it in. Um, it just means it's easier to put all this in one go. But all I've done is I've wired up the switch to the son off. So you can see we've got S1 and S2 on the son off. We come out over these two cables or two wires, one into common, one into the make contact on the switch. And I've just used quite nice sort of flexible individual wires there. They're insulated up 600 volts, so that's totally fine to use. Um, but they're just a bit more flexible, nicer to fit. And I went with white ones because I felt if at least if I use white, it's very obviously not anything to do with mains wiring. You know, brown or blue would look like mains wiring. Red or black, you could argue, you know, could look like old colours, which wouldn't be in this building because it's too new, but 
still, you wouldn't. I, I thought I'd, I'll stick with something like white that's going to be totally unexpected to see, so you're not going to get confused and connect that to the mains. Not that I would, and I'm the only person ever going to touch this, but it just felt like good practice. And then I've just got little ferrules on the end as well because it's flexible or was it fine stranded conductors or something. So that was pretty neat. So that's the set up there. But yeah, that's like little jumper wires I've used, just little little wires with ferrules on the end that I've put in to connect the two together. So, yep, that's it there. It's time to go and get this mounted in the switch box. Okay, so here I am in the bedroom where I'm going to be installing the switch. And as I've mentioned earlier, this is not an instructional video. Do not attempt to do this if you're not competent enough to do this safely. Lighting circuits in the UK are very varied, different different builds are all different, even more different across the world. So if you copy what you're seeing here and you don't actually know what you're doing, you run the risk of blowing something up because the wires, the colour coding may not actually mean what you think it is. For example, it's very common to see blue wires in a back box but on a lighting circuit that are actually a live connection and the person not to sleeve, sleeve them brown. So be very careful because you could mess this up. But yep, so all I've done is I've taken this off, so obviously proved it's all dead, taken the existing switch off and put the key switch in its place. That's just in the exact same situation as the old physical switch or rocker switch, it's now just a key switch. And then we've got obviously all the loop in, loop out through the common. We've got the switch live that'll go up to the light and all the neutrals go into this Wago at the back. I must have done this a while ago because that's actually quite an old style Wago. I tend to use the 221s now, so yeah, that's obviously fairly old. But what we now need to do is obviously this needs to go into the output of the switch, but also we need to have another cable coming out of the output to feed the son off and then also put the son off into the neutral connection as well. So I'm going to get all that in. I'll come back and take a look. Okay, so there we go. That's all in. Not the neatest, but it's absolutely fine. Perfectly safe. So you've got the switch out there. You've got two cables coming out of the switch. One going off the light as before, the other one going into the son off that's in the back. We've got the neutral from the son off also going into the neutral terminal or neutral connector block. And then we've got the cables from the retractor switch on the right just going round the son off as they were before. So there's my new front plate. So you can see we've got the key switch that controls power to the lights and the son off. And the retractor switch will send the signals to the son off. So that's absolutely fine there. Of course, you could wire this differently. For example, if you wanted to use the son off relay, then chances are you'd have the a cable coming out, son off, and up to your lights. But I'm not using the relay and the son off at all, so that doesn't matter. So yeah, that's all there. So now time to get this all sort of the wires sort of neatly sort of like laid back in, so I can get the front plate on, then get the screw back to the wall, and get it all finished. So there we go. So that's all now back on the wall. I just need to clip on the front plate, which should just go on like that. And that's finished product. Now, in theory, if I use the key, I should be able to turn the lights on. So do that. You might not see that on the camera because obviously I've got very bright studio lights on this, but yep, the lights in the room have come on. So that has all worked perfectly. So all I need to do now is go and check this on off still on the network, set it up in those red, and we'll have a working light switch. So there we go, that's all now installed. And what I've now done is I've gone into node red and I've created a couple of blocks just to read the MQTT input from this switch and turn the lights on and off accordingly. My node red setup is a bit complicated now, it probably only makes sense in my head because it's a bit of a mess. But all it does is read the switch input from this, look for a single button press. If the lights are on, it triggers a flow to turn them off. And if the lights are off, it triggers a flow to turn them on. Nothing much more than that. The only other thing I've done as well is I've gone into Asmoto again and set option 13. And all that does is disable, button, is disable multiple button presses. All this means is it just makes it a bit more responsive. So I can't click it multiple times. That doesn't, it doesn't do that anymore. It doesn't do triple or double clicks. But what it does mean is that it no longer has to wait to see if I'm going to click it again. So it makes it a bit more responsive for single clicks. Obviously, if I did want to then have multiple click type events with this button, all I need to do is, is disable option 13 and just deal with a very slight delay when I flick, like, click the button. But yep, that's all now installed. So in theory, if I press this button, the lights will turn off. There we go, lights turn off. Click it again, lights turn on. Very simple, a lot of effort to get to, to replace a light switch with another light switch. But the difference is now is that that controls my smart lights. So for you know months now, I've had it, I have to run into the bedroom, find the remote I have set for the lights, use that to turn the lights on and off. Inevitably, I lose the remote and then can't find it because I can't turn the lights on. It's a bit of a pain. So now I can walk into the bedroom, easily flick the light switch, and it'll just turn on. And it also means that now if I have guests over, I don't have to explain how to turn the lights on. They can walk into the room, see this on the wall, and probably figure out how to control the lights. The only slight negative I found is just this MK retractor switch module. It's very stiff to press. 
I mean, it was sensible to go for it because it aesthetically matches all my other switches, so I may as so it is the correct option to go for here. But I wish it was a little bit lighter to press. It's fine for me, but I imagine maybe an elderly person with, either, with arthritis or something might struggle to press that. So it's fine, but it is a little bit stiff. And I also find sometimes if you're maybe walking into the room and just trying to like hit it like without really putting much effort in, it does take a little bit of effort to click. But yep, yeah, ultimately it all works. I've now got a smart switch. And aesthetically, it matches all the other switches. It doesn't look too out of place. It looks, in my mind, a lot better than a remote next to it. And it's fairly sort of self-explanatory to people who are visiting. So, yeah. That was a fun little project there where I've basically taken a on off mini, flashed the firmware, and turned it into a smart light switch. So hopefully that's fairly interesting for people who are wanting to do similar stuff. And it kind of goes under my ethos of like smart home things where I don't want to rely on talking to voice assistants or using my phone to control things. I want to have smart lights so I can maybe use my phone or I can have coloured lights or dim them in all different weird and wonderful zones. But I still want it to be very self-explanatory so you can turn up, flip the light switch on the wall and just have it work as you'd expect. So yeah, there you go. Thank you very much for watching. And if you're interested in buying some of the tools and parts shown in this video, I've put links in the description. Thanks for watching.